Stein, author of the Spectral Arctic. Um, he can't hear me, but I can hear him, so I'm going to type in questions so there will be a slight delay as we speak, but that's fine. So again, he's the author of Spectral Arctic, History of Dreams and Ghosts in Polar Exploration. <laughs> You'll hear typing as I type, uh, type my question. I wonder how much of a delay we'll get. No problem. No problem. Sorry for the uh, <laughs> sorry for the the mess. Um, but Skype is so bad, and I just can't I can't seem to get it working <laughs> properly. And ah. This has been going on for a long time, and I also can't figure out how to make international calls on WhatsApp, <laughs> which is obviously an important part of communication. All right. So how did you get into writing? And studying this subject. Just give him a moment to read the question. How did I get into the writing and studying of the subject? Yes. Um, yes. I think I think when I was uh, when I was younger, I was really interested in polar fiction. And obviously, I'd read um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and I'd read a few um, adventure stories, but I was also particularly interested in Arthur Conan Doyle's short story, The Captain of the Pole Star. Mm. And that was uh, a gothic tale about a whaling captain who um, is progressively becoming haunted by his. Um, his dead lover in the Arctic and his crew think that he's going insane. Um, but he keeps going farther and farther north in search of this ghostly love. Uh, so there was a connection there between, between ghosts, the Gothic and polar exploration. And, uh, and Conan Doyle was a great gateway into that because of course he was, uh, a great fiction writer, but also somebody who had actually uh, been on northern whaling expeditions himself, so he knew what he was talking about. Tell me how you lay this book out. And again, he's reading the questions I'm typing. So, so the book, um, the book is, I guess, a, a revisionist history. It's, um, yeah, that's that's the that's the, the cover, the spooky cover. Um, it's, it's a revisionist history which is looking again at the classic era of polar exploration but with attention moved slightly away from stories of geographical achievement and heroism and bravery and science and more towards um, stories of dreams and haunting and of bodily breakdowns, of transcendence, of visions, and that move away from the um, traditional uh, focus uh, does a few things. First of all, it, it brings in non-explorers into the story, people who couldn't physically be present in the Arctic. So women, children, um, even the dead, those aren't people you typically class as being part of a polar expedition. Um, but the other thing that it does is it, it brings the history of polar exploration out of a particular silo, which is quite masculine and geographic and probably quite imperialist, and it takes it into a new arena where explorers aren't that noble aren't that heroic or strong, but actually are quite emotional and prone to breakdowns and um, dreaming every night and having visions and fantasies. Um, so it, I guess the, the, lay, the, the book rubs against a particular uh, traditional um, way of writing about the history of polar exploration. <laughs> 
have a personal connection to the Arctic? Uh, personal connection? Uh, I don't think so. No. Um, uh, we in Ireland we would have a tradition of um, celebrating polar explorers uh, who were from from Ireland. So Ernest Shackleton would be the most famous uh, the Antarctic explorer, and um, his colleague Tom Crean who was also from Ireland, from County Kerry. Uh, and when I grew up, they would have been um, celebrated polar heroes. And every year in a town called Athai in County Kildare in Ireland, there's still an autumn school that celebrates uh, the achievements of Ernest Shackleton and the other Irish explorers. Um, and of course, this topic of the Gothic or the ghostly is also part of Shackleton's story because, um, as, as, as many people know, the, the, the account of the fourth man um, presence, do you, do you know the story of the, um, when Shackleton and uh, three colleagues, uh, Shackleton and two colleagues were crossing South Georgia Island in a desperate march to try and reach safety after the expedition collapsed in Antarctica. Uh, there was three of them on the expedition, but all of them believed that there was a fourth presence, um, which has been interpreted to mean an angel or some sort of um, guardian spirit. Um, but this particular incident was written about a lot, especially in Christian um, uh, writings uh, around the World War One era. Uh, so there's a link there between Irish polar explorers and the sense of the polar regions being um, inhabited by spirits, both friendly and uh, not so friendly. Hmm. Do you go into events, personalities or some other aspects of exploration? Yeah, yeah, and um, the center uh, story in the book relates to Sir John Franklin and his uh, doomed uh, 1845 expedition in search of a Northwest Passage. And this was a particularly interesting expedition because it was, uh, it was quite large, it was well funded. Uh, the ships themselves had some interesting technologies. And Sir John Franklin was a veteran polar explorer. He'd been doing it for about 30 years. So there was a sense that um, the British Navy was reaching um, a critical point in its, um, I guess, four decade long assault on the polar regions. And they wanted to achieve this geographical passage through the Canadian Arctic. So the expedition was quite celebrated and there was a huge media buzz about it. So it's linked to kind of the emergence of Victorian print culture as well. And, uh, and then something marvelous happened. The expedition disappeared and this generated uh, a huge outpouring of interest, speculation, uh, frenzied investigations, um, and nobody knew what happened. So around the world, the, common phrase in everybody's lips was, where is Sir John Franklin? Uh, so it inspired ballads, it inspired ordinary people to send in their dreams to naval authorities, to John Franklin's wife, uh, Jane Franklin. It um, inspired people to design wacky and uh, wonderful projects to try and save this lost expedition, including uh, balloon experiments, um, somebody wanted to be fired in a cannon. Uh, somebody else had a great plan to hire uh, ex-prisoners and send them on a kind of a suicidal mission to the Arctic because, well, they're prisoners, so they wouldn't mind the, the hardship. And um, so, so Sir John Franklin features in the book as a kind of a magnetic force that is attracting a huge amount of Victorian culture. He's attracting theories about mesmerism, theories about um, spiritual travel. Uh, popular newspapers are, are 
drawing pictures of the expedition. Um, Jane Franklin, his uh, wife, is campaigning for funds to try and rescue him. Whalers are searching for him. Uh, even the Americans get involved, um, especially um, Henry Grinnell, the, the millionaire um, uh, industrialist, and Elisha Kent Kane, who himself is a kind of a, um, a quasi-historic, um, heroic explorer who becomes obsessed with the Franklin mystery. Uh, so that's the kind of the central story. And around that story, you have uh, other forms of exploration. So there's the physical forms of exploration, naval, um, land-based. But what I'm interested in is also the people who weren't physically in the Arctic, but were um, there in their imagination or there uh, mentally. Um, because that widens out the story and it tells us something about how um, 19th century societies looked at this region. Was the sense that the polar regions were dangerous and evil to the public or something else? Was it midway between the earth and the other side? Yeah, yeah, there was, there was a lot of, um, there would have been a lot of folklore about the polar regions. Um, and it's, it's an old story, particularly in Western Europe. Um, there would have been a lot of um, a kind of a geographical imagination of the far north as uh, an otherworldly place, a place um, of uh, monsters and um, ghosts and the world of the dead. Um, in the medieval period, there would have been particular uh, conceptions of um, Satan as coming from the far north. Um, there would have also been a residual memory or folk uh, memory of uh, the colonies in Greenland and the Viking colonies and um, the engagement between um, uh, the Vikings and the indigenous inhabitants of Greenland. Uh, and most, a lot of those um, engagements were filtered through discourses of the supernatural uh, and this comes across in some of the uh, the sagas uh, of the Vikings. Mm. Uh, and of course, the Greenland colonies also disappeared in a kind of a mysterious um, set of events. Uh, so you've got uh, a kind of a geographical imagination that paints the far north as a place of mystery, a place somehow disconnected from the temperate regions. Um, it's not a particularly... Uh, interesting place to colonize. Uh, so it seeps into popular consciousness as a, uh, an otherworldly place where perhaps there might even be gateway entrances to the center of the earth. And of course, this reappears famously in, in, in uh, Jules Verne, but it, it goes right back to, um, to older conceptions of um, a North Pole or a kind of a great mountain where the North Pole would be or um, a mountain range, or even a kind of a, um, a kind of a, a heavenly land of of um, Spanish-speaking peoples who are in the far north. So you have all these fantasies um, uh, drifting around Europe at the time, and some of it's due to uh, geography. Some of it is due to a perception that this is a very icy realm. Um, this is a place that is so beyond uh, the normal uh, climatic conditions of, of the British Isles. Um, but it also taps into traditions going back to the ancient Greeks that say the far north is a place of wonder and mystery separated from, from our societies. Hmm. Did people want the explorers to bring supernatural protections with them or religious protection? Um, there, there would have been, um, well, I, I guess one of, one of the things I'm, I'm trying to, to work out is, uh, can we use words like the supernatural and the religious, um, as if they're separate mm. and 
one 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 example I always give is if people ask, do you believe in ghosts? And you might give an answer, yes or no, or maybe. Um, but if you ask, do you believe in the Holy Ghost or Holy Ghosts? Well, they say, well, that's a slightly different matter. That's hmm. scriptural or that's religious or that's faith based. Um, but when I, when I think about 19th century people and I think about people on expeditions, uh, my first impression is that they were never simply religious in one moment. They were never simply interested in ghosts in another moment. Um, everybody dreams, everybody has uh, beliefs about their place in the world, about the, um, the voyage that their body will take uh, after death. And when you have uh, Christians, especially evangelical Christians, and a lot of these naval explorers were evangelicals, when they were praying in the Arctic and when they were seeing um, cathedrals in the ice or they were converting Inuit people or they were attending a seance with a shaman, uh, I, I see that as all interrelated. I see that as, um, as, as, as actors in a inhospitable or strange climate uh, tapping into uh, tapping into their feelings, tapping into their emotions. Uh, some of that was through religious ritual, ritual that we would recognize in London or Edinburgh, attending services. And um, some ships would have had a chaplain, other ships would have, uh, the, the, the commander would have uh, led prayers. Um, but you've also got this, this deep-seated interest in, in shamanism and in the... Um, the, the the spiritual culture of Inuit people. So, yes, I think the, the people who went to the Arctic were complicated. They were people who dreamed and who prayed and who uh, wrote letters to loved ones back home. Um, I don't think they were, uh, I don't think they would have recognized uh, the criticism that they might have been superstitious because I think in the 19th century, um, sailors, commanders, navigators. Superstition is one way of describing um, actions or beliefs that may not make sense in one context, but during a storm or when someone is trying to navigate through an ice field, uh, a lot of naval superstitions are actually encouraging the person to just pay attention and to be careful and <laughs> to watch what's happening and yeah. to look out for certain birds, certain signs, not to make certain sounds at certain times. Um, a lot of that is actually um, pragmatic, uh, functionalist ways of being alert. And of course, in a different context, it's superstition. Um, in a more uh, risky context, it's simply following protocols that are hyper uh, vigilant and, and, and possibly irrational. But so, you know, we, we, we have to be careful with words, even though I always use the word supernatural. I'm, I'm, I'm always ambivalent about how I, how I use supernatural, religious, superstitious. Mm -hmm. So when people experienced winter ice and snow, did they imagine that the northern polar wastelands had reached down to them and would affect them in these mysterious ways? Um, well, there, there was there was a sense that the, the the polar regions were were outside of what people have previously experienced, and and you can get a sense of that in the popular press, and some explorers would have uh, corresponded with um, newspaper men, uh, artists, panorama makers, and, and consulted with them in how to. Uh, vividly portray what it was like to be in the polar regions. Um, and, and that did a few things. First of all, it gave people who, were, who couldn't go to the polar regions or never were there, it gave them an impression of what it was like to be there. So a tiny minority of people go on expeditions. Uh, so most people's 
uh, impression of the Arctic is through the media. And therefore, the, the, the creators of these three-dimensional panorama shows, um, the writers of ghost stories, um, such as Conan Doyle's Captain of the Pole Star, um, the writers of popular press, um, they take on a, a real importance in mediating the Arctic to most people. And actually what they mediate is quite stereotypical. So to take one example, the Inuit are usually represented as either happy and smiling and dancing um, or, or savages, um, quasi cannibalistic savages. Um, the Aurora Borealis is usually represented because that becomes a kind of a, a symbol of the Arctic regions. Uh, and uh, the explorers themselves become uh, portrayed as hero navigators, as martyrs for science, as um, disinterested explorers. And, and that, that's quite an important thing in terms of British imperialism, because exploring the Arctic was always seen as clean and as bloodless and mm. a form of travel and exploration that didn't involve um, disease and conquest and rape and dispossession, but was purely navigational discovery. Um, and actually, um, these uh, forms of mediation uh, assist in that idea that the Arctic is antiseptic. It's a place of wonder. It's a place, it's a blank slate. Um, the British are there mapping it. Um, as if no one had lived there for thousands of years and had their own maps of the regions. Um, so there is uh, a history of being in the Arctic and the British are one aspect of that history. And actually they stand out as quite incompetent inhabitants of the region. Yeah. Uh, and then there is the more stereotypical idea of inhabiting the Arctic which is uh, reflected in the popular culture of the Victorian period. Um, and the classic example of that is the way the ship is adapted for winter living. So these ships become homes for the men during winter. Uh, and, you know, if, if you think about it from a distance, it's just, it's, it says a lot about, um, British 19th century culture that explorers are actually turning a ship which is stuck in ice for nine months of the year. They're turning it into a home with a roof and fires and schools and a cricket pitch and filtered water and a prayer room and, uh, and a, a room for uh, nursing wounds, um, a bakery, a brewery. And that's not normal. <laughs> and one of the things that comes across in the, um, the wonderful Inuit oral accounts that we have um, is just how strange the presence of Europeans was in the Arctic. And, and we don't usually get that perspective in British histories that actually the strangeness of the Arctic isn't its... Uh, climate or its um, um, aerial phenomena or its um, ice or its mirages. The strangeness is the presence of Europeans uh, in gigantic boats. Mm -hmm. uh, so from an Inuit perspective, these boats arriving with over 100 men dressed in wool and leather boots, that's extremely strange. Their language is strange. Their intentions are strange. It's strange that there's no women. Uh, <laughs> their objects are strange. Their food is strange. Even their feces is strange. And that's somehow how they could track uh, the presence of Europeans through their, through their scat. <laughs> um, so once we take another perspective on Arctic exploration, we start to turn the dial and realize actually it's, Europeans, their presence in the Arctic is, is extremely odd. Uh, 
and their actions there are extremely odd and mm. maybe not necessarily heroic and glorious uh, or certainly not as, as we might have first imagined mm. so what other secondary issues do you cover in the book um, that we haven't discussed yet um, I, I discuss uh, a few a few stories um, relating to uh, the Franklin expedition and in in particular uh, the way that young women tried to contact the expedition through trances uh, and this is this is quite a controversial area because um, for a long, long time it was believed that um, Franklin's widow, uh, Jane Franklin and also uh, people around her may have uh, engaged with some clairvoyance or psychics um, to give them s some advice on where Franklin might be. Um, so, so we knew that, but um, in the book I go into a, a deeper investigation um, and show that uh, not only was, was Jane Franklin attending uh, mediums and psychics, but she also attended a, a scryer and this is somebody who uses a crystal ball to um, to mm. look into the future or to um, to look into a distant location uh, and um, tell the viewer what's happening. And um, as as a as a as a side uh, story to that, um, Jane Franklin was contacted by an Irish man actually um, called uh, Captain William Coppin uh, and. He was a shipbuilder in uh, Derry in the north of Ireland, and his daughter died in 1849. Uh, her name was Wheezy. She was a four-year-old. She died of gastric fever. And he reported that the ghost of his dead daughter returned to his home after she died in the, in the form of a blue orb, and that this orb um, wrote some um, navigational points on a wall, uh, points which suggested that Sir John Franklin was um, near Prince Regent Inlet in the Arctic. So Captain Coppin wrote to Jane Franklin and said, listen, you may not believe this, but my, my dead daughter has, has reappeared and is suggesting that Franklin is in this particular region of the Arctic. What do you think? Would you like to talk about it? And Jane Franklin is extremely interested. And um, she invites him to, uh, uh, to uh, mainland Britain and they have discussions and uh, Jane Franklin uh, adapts her uh, policy to take account of this ghostly information. And she is privately funding expeditions to search for her husband. But mm. now she's using the testimony of Coppin because he's a credible person. He's a shipbuilder. He's an inventor. He's, he's, um, um, he's somebody who has um, a certain authority in the area. And his testimony causes Jane Franklin to uh, change her uh, geographical um, coordinates for two of her expeditions. Now, the two expeditions that go in search of Franklin based on the ghost's testimony and get stuck in the ice, so they never actually get to the region. But I guess from a hindsight point of view, the region was actually um, the key to solving the mystery of where the expedition um, failed. This yeah. is the Prince Regent in that area. And the reason why it's controversial is that um, when Jane Franklin died, the inheritors of her estate and her supporters and her niece, who was quite a powerful um, uh, colleague of hers, all denied that she was ever influenced by psychics or ghosts or mediums and really tried to repair um, that aspect of her reputation. But in the book, I go into, into some detail into the, uh, the letters that still exist in archives um, mm. in which she's discussing these, uh, what were called revelations, with other people. And more importantly, she's discussing them with admiralty officials. 
with naval explorers. Uh, so for me, that, that, that says that in the 1840s and 1850s especially, um, there isn't such a barrier between uh, um, religious visionaries, naval authorities, and supernatural communication. That actually, at certain times, especially when there's a major disaster, especially when something goes missing, um, we know this from missing airplanes, from missing ships, uh, when there's an information vacuum and when um, search and rescue fails, when a child goes missing, uh, people will look for other forms of information um, because when there's an information vacuum, um, all information is hopeful. Uh, it's like data. It's, you don't reject any data that's coming in. You keep the letters, you respond positively, uh, uh, you accept them as leads. And Jane Franklin was doing the same thing. Um, and it so happens that the testimony of most of these psychics was, was baloney. Mm -hmm. They were directing expeditions to vastly different parts of the Canadian Arctic. But the testimony of Coppin um, and Coppin's family was quite interesting. And from a cultural historical perspective, the question is, why does that become embarrassing in the later 1850s? Why does Jane Franklin um, stop talking about it? Why do letters go missing? Uh, and why is this denied in the 1860s, 1870s? Uh, and that tells us something about the changing relationship between um, uh, elite society, middle class society, and this sense of the supernatural, the idea that um, ghostly children from Ireland or uh, teenage clairvoyants from the north of England can have any authority over major Arctic expeditions, that becomes uh, intolerable. So it's, it's, it's a story about why the incredible becomes credible for a 10 year period. And then why it becomes incredible again. And I guess the, the underlying message is that um, um, the supernatural is, is, is socially created. Um, mm. It's messy. It's, um, it's not bounded. It can, it can leak. And many of the people who uh, denied ever having any interests in this kind of thing well, we can prove that some of them attended seances. We can prove that some of these Arctic commanders uh, were in the very room with Jane Franklin when uh, there was a scrying experiment with one of these crystal balls. Mm. And of course, all of these Arctic commanders were deeply religious, so they would have had spiritual beliefs in any case. So, you know, there's a tendency to think of explorers in the past, particularly um, middle-aged naval authorities as being commonsensical and stiff upper lip, but the documents tell us something different. They tell us that they were interested in um, the accounts coming from uh, clairvoyant seances. Uh, they didn't discount them immediately, but again, when there is a mystery, when there is a lack of information, particularly involved in the Arctic, which, as, as we discussed earlier, was already thought of as an otherworldly place, well, then it could kind of make sense that some people in a trance might be able to spiritually travel to this strange region, especially if there are contemporary technologies like the telegraph, which is doing precisely the same thing. So might not some of these young women or some of these ghosts actually be contacting an Arctic expedition through natural but undiscovered means. So this, this is the kind of language that people were using that um, psychics might not be traveling in the occult. They might actually simply be human telephones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is, this, is, this is the kind of language that is emerging in the 1840s. Wow, that's interesting. So what resources did you use to do your research? <laughs> 
so I, I guess um, there is a certain amount of interesting material in the journals of explorers themselves. Um, so they would normally have quite a sober language in how they describe the Arctic. Uh, and that language does break down on occasions, especially when they're discussing the aurora borealis or um, ice or mirages. Uh, so you can get a sense of um, their geographical imaginations in those moments. But if you're looking for accounts of dreams and emotions and um, uh, a sense of foreboding or of fear, then you would only get it in private diaries. And a lot of those would have been in, um, in the British Library in London and in the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. And in the diaries, you get a better sense of what it was like to be in the Arctic, what a person could feel, uh, what a person could see. Uh, and uh, there, a decent source for the, um, the psychological aspect of being in the Arctic. Um, the, the second major source would have been um, uh, digitized newspapers. Mm. So there's been a real uh, revolution in, in the digitizing of newspapers in the past 10 years in Britain. And we've now got access to a lot of regional and provincial newspapers uh, where people are writing letters to the editor and the editor is printing them. And when there's a major international event like the Crimean War um, or the loss of Franklin, uh, people have opinions. And in many cases, those opinions are printed. And those opinions are marvelous and interesting. And some of them are crazy, but almost everybody has an opinion on Franklin. People are guessing where he is. Some people think he was captured by the Russians. Some people think He's hidden in a kind of a, a polar jungle, a kind of a temperate place beyond the North Pole. Uh, some people think the expedition is trapped in an iceberg. Um, so there's, there's, there's lots of hoaxes and rumors and speculation. And you get a sense of this in the newspaper press. Um, and again, that traditionally wouldn't have been part of the history of polar exploration because it's taking place in Britain in mm -hmm. newspapers. But yeah. it actually tells us a lot about how people thought about a place they could never visit. Um, how people thought about um, expeditions that were uh, disconnected from home. How do you make a connection with a lost expedition? Um, and then the third form would be a correspondence. A correspondence to Jane Franklin. Uh, and correspondence to other explorers where people are, are mentioning their dreams uh, they're talking about their visions um, and that's qu a quite a rare uh, source and it's even rarer because we know that a lot of people would have um, destroyed letters and there would have been some um, self-censorship uh, so I guess one of the one of the other um, aims of the book was to try and make a link between all of the topics I've been discussing and, and um, a particular um, play by Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins, um, and this is called *The Frozen Deep*, and it appeared in 1857, and that was an interesting source because this play is quite important in Dickens's career. Uh, and it's a play about a lost polar expedition hmm. uh, in which the two main characters uh, are at risk of killing each other on the expedition because they love the same woman. <laughs> uh, so it's an, old, it's an old kind of story. Um, but what is interesting um, for my purposes is that um, the people back home in the story are so afraid that the expedition will collapse because they are consulting a Scottish nurse who claims to have second sight. And mm. the nurse says that the men are going to kill each other. It's going to be a total disaster. And when Dickens was writing this with Wilkie Collins, we get the sense that he was disturbed by 
the whole relationship between the Arctic and the supernatural. And he used this play as a way of neutralizing that threat. And the threat is represented as a Scottish nurse with these crazy second sight opinions. Um, but Dickens put a lot of mental energy into the play. And by the end of the play, the prophecies of the Scottish nurse don't come to fruition. And the character that Dickens plays actually, with a stiff upper lip, uh, refuses to engage in cannibalism, refuses to murder his love rival, and sacrifices himself for the expedition. Hmm. Uh, so this was a play that would have um, attracted thousands of uh, audience goers in Manchester and London, including Queen Victoria. Uh, and many people reported being moved to tears by Dickens's performance. So it was a performance on stage, but it was also a kind of a cultural performance which said that there has been this link between polar expeditions and the supernatural, and this is how we neutralize it. We stand up for British values and we reject uh, doom-laden prophecies of murder and cannibalism and un-English behavior. Um, so that's not, that's a primary source that isn't written by an explorer it's not about um it's not doesn't contain much historic information about an expedition but it tells us a lot about um the opinions of dickens and audience goers um opinions relating to the arctic as a place where the supernatural can emerge but also be defeated so what other archives, if any, stand out for their useful documents or journals? Other archives? Well, uh, the, the National Maritime Museum in London has, has a very good archive. Uh, also, the Royal Geographical Society in London, they have a very good archive relating to this. Um, and the Royal Geographical Society in particular has the papers of a wonderful eccentric called William Parker Snow. And um, Snow is one of these visionaries who um, is constantly writing letters to the newspapers um, with his plans to rescue Franklin. Uh, he's writing letters to Jane Franklin and she actually hires him briefly to assist on an expedition because she's impressed by his, um, his uh, enthusiasm. Uh, but Snow becomes particularly obsessed with the Franklin expedition, so obsessed that he um, he nearly goes bankrupt trying to fund an expedition from Australia to the Arctic. Uh, and even though he only gets to the Arctic once, briefly for a summer season, he spends the rest of his life up until the 1890s uh, talking about the Arctic, writing about it, and obsessing over it, and imagining that he's at the center of a great um, criminal enterprise trying to destroy his correct theories on Franklin. So he's a real paranoid um, person. Um, he's somebody who, who imagines the Arctic to be a space of morality. And for him, trying to rescue Franklin was, was akin to a crusade. And he believed that he was chosen by God to complete this enterprise. So his papers are in the Royal Geographical Society and they're quite interesting to, to go through um, because it gives you an insight into um, some of the eccentric personalities that were attracted to this mystery. And I guess you could, you could draw parallels between the Franklin mystery and other major events in the 20th century, other disappearances um, or, or, or disasters, because these things tend to um, they tend to open up and invite people to speculate, to invite people to write letters. It creates wonderful sources and, and data for historians working on them in the future, because it taps into the imagination it taps into people's perceptions of place, but it also goes against traditional um, archival forms of 
gathering historical facts based on uh, what a civil servant wrote or what a politician said in Parliament uh, or what an editor said in a newspaper. Actually, we've got this other stream of information uh, which is unauthorized, illegitimate, frequently crazy, but ultimately it's coming from people in the community. It's coming, it's unsolicited and it's it's raw and it's it's deeply fascinating. So what was the most enjoyable part of the research? Um, I think some of the most enjoyable parts of the research uh, involved uh, bringing women back into the story. Um, by definition, these expeditions were, were, were totally male. Um, and in, in cultural history, of course, in the past 20 years, there's been, there's been a revolution in, in the way we, we think about history, the way we think about absence and um, the way people are written out of history. And there was rarely any place for women in histories of polar exploration and geographical achievement because they weren't there. Um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't present. So there's, there is a huge difference between physical presence and cultural presence or imagined presence. And on the one hand, we have explorers in the Arctic who are deeply emotional people who are um, husbands and fathers and lovers. And they are constantly thinking about their wives or their children. And they are dreaming about them, writing to them, drawing pictures for them writing them poems. Uh, so they are also present with them in the Arctic, in that sense. From the British sense, uh, we can see with the involvement of clairvoyance, um, with the involvement of writers, uh, that women could have access to the Arctic in a mediated form. So. A good example of this would be uh, Charlotte Bronte, um, who wrote Jane Eyre in um, 1847. So it's around the time of the, the Franklin um, disappearance. And, um, and in, in, in that novel, uh, Jane goes on uh, a kind of spiritual journey to the Arctic by reading a book. So she's reading a book called um, uh, Thomas Buick's History of British Birds. And in the book, there's a discussion of um, some of the birds of the Arctic. And uh, Jane goes into this reverie, this kind of dream state where she travels to the Arctic. And that I take that as a kind of a representative of a practice that many newly literate women were doing. Mm. Uh, they were reading Arctic novels. They were reading novels of travel in general, and they were mentally traveling to these places um, because they couldn't physically travel. Uh, so there was that presence um, from a distance and uh, male writers pick up on that dichotomy um, and that feeds into this um, subgenre of the polar supernatural. And the example of Arthur Conan Doyle is probably the best because there are some pretty poor examples of this theme out there. Mm. But the typical story is nearly always um, a lonely or crazy Arctic navigator is exhibiting uh, paranoid or delusional behavior. And the crew speculate that he is um, haunted by a woman or the crew believe that they are haunted by a woman or they're being chased by this spectral feminine presence through the Arctic or because of some misdemeanors that they've engaged with um, with the Inuit because of some grave digging or some um, a physical assault against an Inuk woman that the expedition is being cursed by a female sorceress. Uh, so there is that whole subgenre of ghost stories in which manly men in the Arctic are being pursued by female specters. Hmm. 
Um, and some newspapers pick up on that, and you see that in Punch, the famous um, periodical, where um, uh, the Arctic starts to become represented as a monstrous, powerful, frigid woman who can um, prohibit male entrance into her realm. So there's a whole uh, cultural discourse about ice, icy women, um, passages, um, frozen routes. Uh, so basically the point is that the Arctic is a space of gender. And mm. that's a part I really enjoy writing because you're using very different sources than you would normally use when you're writing about how men move from point A to point B mm -hmm. and how many died in between. You're actually, you're reading these wonderful ghost stories and these pulp fiction and you're, you're thinking, well, why is, this, why is there this association between ghostly women and the Arctic? And it's essentially because women couldn't physically be present, so they were spectrally present. And mm -hmm. contemporaries picked up on that and reflected it in fiction, in dreams, in paintings, in cartoons. So women mm. are present, but just not in a actual physical way, but in many other ways. Hmm. What was the most difficult part of the research? Uh, what was the most difficult part? Um, I suppose there, there, there is a temptation to, um, to normalize this behavior. And I, I mentioned earlier the, the corrective, the important corrective that we have other perspectives on the presence of explorers in the Arctic. And, um, but there is something deep rooted in all of us in Western Europe, possibly in America as well, um, definitely in Canada that um, this activity is noble, it is worthy, it is heroic, it is um, by definition a wonderful thing, a brave thing. Um, and something I, I always ask my students to do is to think about it from a di different perspective. What happened in, in the 16th century if uh, a group of Inuit arrived on the shores of Britain in a, in a hide boat uh, and started asking people to draw their maps and tell them about a route to Spain. Um, and people have lots of different opinions about what would happen, but none of them particularly pleasant. Uh, whereas the exact same thing happening in the 1570s in the Arctic is seen as the start of a great narrative, a great um, period of polar exploration. Uh, and that's normal because we have collectively normalized this voyaging impulse, this um, impulse to try and map the globe uh, according to our needs and desires. But mm -hmm. if for one instance we could look at it from a different perspective, from the perspective of people who live there, uh, we'd see that it's so strange. So the most challenging part, the most difficult part is to try and get into that perspective. And it's incredibly difficult if you don't have um, um, any uh, allies uh, on the ground there, or you don't have uh, language abilities, or you don't have any traditional knowledge. So it all comes back to, we rely on the sources. And luckily, a lot of Inuit oral histories have been published and, um, and written up. Um, so, so we, we need more of that. Uh, mm. And there'll always be that tension between the instinct to, to celebrate any form of movement in the polar regions as being necessarily heroic and the reality that that's very odd behavior. And, mm. you know, we can use the analogy with space travel and think, well, you know, people think of rockets going up to outer space and people walking on the moon and I suppose that's a great achievement and quite meaningful um, but when we think of the Arctic they, they weren't astronauts in the Arctic they weren't landing on the moon they weren't landing on blank space they were landing in a region that was 
was vibrant, was um, had seasons. Um, it wasn't always dark. Uh, it had inhabitants with complex cultures. Uh, they could read maps. They they knew their area. They had um, religious beliefs. Um, they had art, culture. But the narrative is that explorers land in these locations and discovered the place for them. <laughs> and the most dangerous thing we can do is conflate Antarctic and Arctic exploration because, of course, Antarctica is uninhabited. It is uh, or was a non-human space. Um, and traditionally, going back maybe 50, 70 years, there would be combined histories of polar exploration as if both regions were similar. Mm. So there would be a history of Arctic and Antarctic polar exploration as if the Arctic didn't have hundreds of different indigenous groups, multiple languages, uh, multiple nation states and cultures spread across the whole circumpolar region. Uh, there was a kind of a conflation between um, the model of the Antarctic as a blank space of mapping and discovery and Cold War politics. Uh, so that that's that's quite a tricky thing to 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 um, to defend against that temptation to um, conflate the polar regions and think of all activity in the regions as necessarily noble and brave. Can you speak to any difficulties in getting the book finished and published and how you overcame those? Um, I, I suppose a lot of the difficulties in getting the book published were, were self-generated in that, uh, like, like a lot of historians, I don't write particularly well. Uh, I've had to work hard on translating archival material and ideas into um, readable prose. And it's not something we're trained in, it's something we, we, we learn again every day how to communicate well, how to get an idea across. And I guess a lot of people who read academic books are put off by certain things, and I do understand that. Um, but when we are teaching in universities and when we're trying to get book deals, um, there are certain things we need to get across in a book. We need to advance the field. And that's something that a... Um, uh, a popular writer doesn't have to do uh, necessarily. And that might explain why you pick up an ac academic book and there's theory and there's uh, links to philosophers and there's kind of digressions into um, mind-body dualism or what have you. Um, but a lot of that is down to the, 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 the publishing industry. Uh, and academic culture and the need to constantly be challenging predecessors and creating a new vision of the past. Um, so that can be a challenging thing to, um, to work with when, when you're trying to tell uh, an interesting story. Um, but in, in, in general, um, this project came out of a, of a fellowship I had, which gave me the time to go to the archive to write these papers. Um, and a lot of the chapters were originally conference papers. So I was going to uh, conferences um, being held by uh, literary people, by social historians, by naval historians. So uh, I was getting a lot of feedback from different types of historians and academics. Um, I was also going to a fair amount of um, popular talks. So uh, I had a particularly good talk in a um, in a bookstore in London uh, called Treadwells, uh, which is is famous for um, selling books on the occult and offering people courses on witchcraft and healing and um, uh, the use of crystals. 
And the audience there were great because they were coming at this from a very different angle than like an academic audience. They were mm -hmm. interested in, in the details. They were interested in the magic. They were interested in symbols and relics and um, superstitions. Uh, so trying to marry different audiences and create the book was was quite challenging. And um, from experience, whenever you write about ghosts or the supernatural as a historian, you're always, um, you're nearly always crushed between two icebergs, to use, to use a pertinent metaphor. Um, on the one hand, there will be people wanting to read a really good story uh, with fleshy characters and uh, narrative arcs and um, drama and suspense and gory details and actual ghost stories, actual ghost stories. And that's fine and that's, that's great. On the other hand, we have an obligation to write a scholarly work, uh, a book that will be accepted by peer reviewers, that will be published by an academic press, um, that will advance the field, that will be recommended for um, university teaching courses. And for that particular audience, they wouldn't be interested in a very populist book on ghost stories set in the Arctic. Yeah. Um, they might be interested in a story about the history of ghosts in the Arctic with detailed archival evidence and a kind of a, um, an agenda that's setting out to break down a particular way of looking at the Arctic and bring in women and children and the supernatural to tell a different type of story. So two very different groups of audiences, both have different ideas about ghosts. Maybe one group is more interested in literal hauntings, ghost stories, and one group is more interested in the symbols, the signs, what a ghost represents to a society. So you've got to, um, you've got to bear both of those in mind um, whenever you look into the history of um, of ghosts and ghost belief. And that's something I've found quite a lot that you've, you, um, you're, you're open to, you've got a great audience, you've, lots of people are interested, but with, with very different, um, with very different agendas. So some people are asking, what does a ghost mean? Some people are asking, have you seen any ghosts? <laughs> uh, those are very different questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm not sure I have answers to either yet. But. Okay. What's your next writing project? Um, next writing project is a. Uh, I'm turning to dreams again, and I'm trying to work out the relationship between um, industrial accidents in Britain in the 19th century and uh, precognition or whether people um, discussed their dreams, um, people who worked in risky industries. So basically I'm thinking of the dreams of miners and there's a lot of folklore relating to uh, mining disasters being predicted by miners. So there's lots of ballads and stories that miners would tell their wives the night before. I think I'm going to die tomorrow. I had a weird dream. Um, and there is significant evidence that during the inquests after major mining disasters, um, a lot of widows would have told the coroner that my husband did predict this disaster. Um, so I'm interested in, in tapping into that. And I guess my main question there is, um, is mining considered to be so risky a profession that dreaming or, or talking about your dreams uh, is a kind of a way of discussing risk? It's a way of mm. 
discussing safety and alertness and carefulness. Mm. Uh, so maybe when when men are talking about the dreams of disaster to the wives, they're not talking about kind of a supernatural communication. But what they're actually saying is, um, my job is quite risky, and I'm t telling you all the time that I think I'm going to die. So the project is about how uh, sharing your dreams is normal in the 19th century. Sharing your dreams is actually related to industry, it's related to mines, it's related to people who worked in quarries, people who worked at sea. But that suddenly stops around 1920 and people stop discussing their dreams and dreams become embarrassing. They become something that are intensely private and that public culture of sharing dreams and talking to policemen or coroners about dreams, that's gone. So I'm interested in teasing out why that happens in the 20th century. Uh, I just wrote a joke, bankers aren't talking about dreams of financial disasters. Uh, then I ask, where can people find the book in your ongoing work online? <laughs> no, they're not, talk <laughs> they're not talking yet, no. But we're all having nightmares. We're all having, I'm, we're, we're still talking about our nightmares about banking disasters. Um, People can find uh, details of my work on my website, which is uh, shanemacarriston.net um, and on my webpage on Newcastle University History Department. And the book is available on uh, the UCL Press website. And I guess the novelty of this book is that it, it's available to purchase in paperback or hardback, but it's also open access, uh, which means anybody can freely access it um, in PDF format from anywhere in the world. Um, and I'm happy if anybody reads it and um, shares it, um, because the point of these books is that they're read, not that you make money from them. So. And just to spell Shane McCorstein, it's S-H-A-N-E-M-C-C-O-R-R-I-S-T-I-N-E dot net. Any final thoughts? Uh, th thank, you for, thank you for talking to me um, from a, uh, a spooky and spectral Skype connection uh, across the Atlantic. Um, I guess uh, uh, final thoughts uh, would be to um, for people to keep an eye on what's happening in the Arctic because uh, Franklin ships were found in 2014 and 2016, and this has inspired a whole new set of uh, debates about uh, how the Inuit communities inherit this disaster. And there's talk about um, uh, supernatural curses over the region because of the shipwrecks. Um, but the story is also inspiring sci-fi again. And there's this new series called The Terror uh, on AMC, which was a very interesting take on the Franklin Expedition. Not historically grounded, I should say, because it does involve a kind of a de demonic polar bear <laughs> evil spirit monster uh, but interesting nonetheless to see how the franklin myth and the sense of the arctic supernatural is being uh, revised and adapted in the 21st century cool well thank you thank you for speaking with me thank you chris no problem lovely to talk to you you too bye, -bye. thank you for listening don't forget to visit chrisalvarez.com or theartofsciencefiction.com for more great interviews, photos, and articles. Your visits help support this podcast. Please remember that my first name, Chris, does not have an H in it. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't.
I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez Sci Fi, on Facebook under Chris Alvarez WLC, on YouTube under Chris Alvarez WLC, and on Twitter under Chris Alvarez WLC. Thanks for listening and keep imagining the future.